So I'm going to have to maybe replace my phone or something because that's getting old. But um, we need to have it intellectually, but we also intellectually. Need to have it in our hearts. Yes. Because why does Paul say that the lost are lost in Second Thessalonians chapter 1, I think it is, maybe 2? Remember that they received not the love of the truth. And what sets God's people apart from, or let me rephrase that, what sets real Christians apart from fake Christians is that love of the truth. And not that it's our job to judge other people whether they are real or not, but it's, you know, it's one of the things that the Bible shows us. So the lesson says the Protestant reformers had something 21st century people desperately need. And that is a purpose for their lives. Have you ever lived without purpose? Mm -hmm. That's why I became a Christian. Yeah, and what was that like? Wasn't fun. Not no, fun. Not <laughs> the word I'm thinking, but it was not good. <laughs> it was not good. No. That's fair. Um, it says, uh, people who live purposeless lives, their beliefs are shallow. They're, they don't have anything of substance. Little of real significance matters to them, and they have nothing worth dying for, so they have nothing worth living for. Have you ever been willing to die for your belief? I don't think probably any of us have ever been brought to that situation. I could be wrong, but have you ever had somebody hold a gun up to your head and tell you to give up your beliefs or else? Not yet. Not yet? We will. We will. It happens here and there, like the Columbine shooting. I remember that one. I was thinking that very thing. Yeah, I remember I, right after that happened, I, wrote, I, I used to be real big into poetry in high school, and so I, I wrote a poem about it. And I remember posting it online, and somebody commented, uh, complaining about the bit about not going to heaven <laughs> when we die. <laughs> I think the thing that but, helps me is the fact that Jesus says that whoever tries to save their life will lose it. Mm -hmm. So what did happen to Peter when he tried to save himself? That's a good point. What happened to Peter when he tried to save himself by denying Jesus? What happened to him? Yeah. What was that experience like for him? Was that fun? No. Uh, <laughs> he was devastated. The desire of ages. Yeah. He, he went out and wept bitterly in the desire of ages ad that he wanted to die. So when we try and save ourselves from the things that are coming, we're going to receive exactly what we're afraid of and that's something i've tried to teach savannah is the consequences that you try to avoid are the consequences you're going to bring upon yourself mm -hmm. right at least when you're trying to avoid punishment um i made a video a few weeks ago where talking about how modern american christianity they want to turn this country around they want to bring god and morals back into this country in order to avoid this country going down the tubes and being destroyed. But in, in the very way that they're trying to bring morality back into this country is going to bring destruction to this country. Mm -hmm. right. Amen. So, they're trying to legislate it and force They're people. trying to do it their way, yes, yeah, yes. Force people. Did you have a thought, sweetheart? I, I have a couple. Um, <laughs> so the first one that I was thinking is talking about going back to the memory verse. Uh, where it says, you have hidden, uh, your word have I hidden in my heart. And when we think of the heart, we think of the seed of emotion. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, you asked why, why is it not just us here? And, you know, I know that we're not, you know, we're not supposed to trust our emotions. Mm -hmm. Run off of our emotions. But if we don't make it personal, then it is just head knowledge. Yeah, Absolutely. And, Mm -hmm. And so I think it goes back to that in that if we're going to have the word hidden in our heart, we're going to have a relationship with the person that put it there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's going to change everything. The second thought that I had was going to the comment or the quote that said uh, that they have nothing worth dying for, so they have nothing worth living for. But you asked how many people would be willing to die for their faith. A lot of people will claim that they're willing to die for their faith. But how many people are willing to live for their faith? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important question right now. 
because a lot of people are quiet. It's all quiet on the West Coast front. <laughs> and I think as a community, we need to be louder. We need to live our faith so mm-hmm. other people see it and feel it. And not just, oh yeah, if something happens, I'll definitely die for my faith. But we've got to be in a place now that we're willing to live for it. Because you won't be able to die for your faith if you're not willing to live for it now. Mm-hmm. That's exactly it. And so, oh, I thought somebody else was saying something. And that's what really set the Protestant reformers and those who accepted the reform faith apart from those who didn't. During the Dark Ages, the, the, as Kathy was saying, um, modern Christianity wants to legislate their morals. And that's what really set the papacy apart during the Dark Ages is they controlled civil power and legislated their own version of morality. And that's really one of the things that brought persecution upon the reformers was they said, no, you cannot force morality. You cannot force people to accept this message. I was, I've been reading to the great, not reading, um, listening to the great controversy this week as I've been driving my routes and listening to, about Martin Luther and how he, he wrote all of this and he, he was very bold and he was very forward and pointed and very blunt at times. Um, but even he was like, you know, you you can't force this. You cannot legislate morality. You cannot force people to accept your faith. Mm-hmm. Wasn't it E.G. A.D.C. E.F.G. Jones? I, I can't remember his first two initials. A.T. Jones? Yes, him. That when they were trying to pass a Sunday law, he was like, yes, it was the Sabbath. That was him. I would still go against it because you yeah. can't. And that was the difference, and that, that, that was, in that instance, it was the government wanted to pass a Sunday law, and A.T. Jones went and said, no, this is not biblical, this is not okay. And the Seventh-day Baptist says, we're cool with it as long as you give us a caveat for Sabbath. Um, and A.T. Jones still said, that's still not okay, you cannot legislate the Bible. Um, and that's one of the reasons that's going to make this Project 2025 so dangerously and so dangerous and deceptive, is because while it defaults the National Sabbath to Sunday, it also, uh, I think, includes a caveat for Sabbath keepers initially. But that, that will change. But that is going to be the Trojan horse uh, that, well, I shouldn't say going to be. It has a high potential of being the Trojan horse uh, to bring in the mark here soon. We have to remember Jesus didn't force. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I've asked Third people. Made the wrong choice, you know? Yeah. But God doesn't force. That's not right. Yeah. And that's the key, and that's one of the things this last paragraph on Sabbath says. Understanding these eternal truths will prepare us for the final crisis in the great controversy between good and evil. The battles that the reformers fought is not yet over, and we need to pick up where they left off. And the reformers didn't force anyone to accept their faith, right? Um, and I've asked people before, I said, well, where did Jesus use the Roman government of his day to get done what he wanted done? And you never find that example anywhere in the Bible. So let's go to Sunday's lesson, and let's read these scriptures in that first question. So if somebody can read Psalm 119, verses 103 and 104. Somebody get 119, 147. And then 119, verse 162. And the question is, what was David's attitude towards God's word? And how did this impact the reformers? And what does it have to do with us today? So, go read that first one, please. Okay. It says, I prevented the dying of the morning and cried. I hoped in thy word. In 162, anybody have that one? I have it. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. So there was, this, it was during the last quarter, and I'm seeing a pattern now, now that I think about it, a pattern through the 
different Sabbath school lessons, and that's the importance of Bible study. Um, and the last quarter, there was a lesson we went over talking about the range of human emotions and the importance of trusting God throughout all of those emotions. It's not that emotions are bad, but they can be deceptive. Um, and no matter whether we feel God's presence or not, we need to hope in Him. Because we have this initial one that says, uh, that where David is, is explaining how much he loves the Word of God. Then we have the last one where he's rejoicing in the Word of God. And then we have this middle verse where he seems to be um, in some sort of, sort of emotional distress, but he still says, I hope in the Word of God. So how did David then see God's Word? I mean, you pretty much heard my thought on that, but there's other people here, so... How did David see the Word of God? I think it's a, a road for life. A road map. map for his life. A road map for life, he, yeah. He loved it. Uh, he followed it. Do you read the whole of Psalm 119, and it's all that way. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not that... Now, he truly did love God and love his Word, but, you know, he still fell. He had his moments. Yeah, sure. he, he greatly fell. <laughs> But um, he repented. You know, and he went back to God's God. word. Yeah. So how did it impact the reformers? And think about maybe your favorite reformer. I don't I like Luther, Tyndale. Those are a couple of my favorites. Huss. How did the Bible affect them? We'll go over a little bit of them. Huh? Wycliffe, yeah. He was one of the... English reformers. As I read this week's lesson, uh, every lesson, you know, had kind of a different, they featured a different mm -hmm. uh, reformer. Yeah. And each one, you know, they were already Oops. Christians, but each one said, you know, I just, in, in one way or another, just said, uh, the truth just like knocked my socks off, basically. Um, I, and I heard the words, I was just, you know, shaken to the core. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we went to Russia the first time, and we, we had purchased 5,000 Russian Bibles. And we're passing them out. The pastor over there had on the lock and key. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. And to see someone elderly hold a Bible for the first time in their life to see the glow on their face I had one lady had a heart attack oh. I had one lady fall down to her knees start kissing my feet and I started and I thought Lord I just gave her a Bible and for the first time in my life I realized it's not just a Bible yeah and I, it took this Russian people to teach me God's word the importance yeah. Holiness, the sacredness. Because over here we have thousands of them. You can go to the Dollar Tree and. Full of them. Yeah. We're very privileged here. We are. I remember seeing a video, I think it was of ch some Chinese believers, and they had a box of them, Bible shipped. And as soon as they took the plastic and the cellophane off, and you, they just ran toward it, everybody just started grabbing a Bible. And they started doing the same thing. They, they were hugging that Bible and just, they were so emotional over it. And, and, and it's, it really makes you think about our lack of passion to the Word of God. Well, you know, one of the stories in here talks about Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, what I would give, I'm paraphrasing, to have one of these for my own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I must have probably been a Bible in a lifetime or something. He took that Bible and just, 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 just looking at that to me, 
there are some things that make you realize the importance of that kind of thing. And here, where we don't have persecution, not, not yet, right. soon, but not yet, or, or we're not put in a crisis situation, or we're not on our deathbed, you know, 102 years old, you don't have much time left, right. most likely. Right. Most of us aren't in those situations where we're not brought to that decision. Yeah, I'm glad that didn't happen while you were. I just didn't want to happen right then. Yeah. But, right. you know, but also she and I talked about when people said you knew, mm -hmm. why didn't you tell us? Yeah. And that's kind of become one of my things is I don't want to be found unfaithful to what God has called me to do. Absolutely. So while I have, like, really bad social anxiety in certain situations, I'm going to do it in the way that I can, you know. Um, I saw hands. Yes, I, I can't remember the name. Now, the man that uh, baptized my dad in Coffeyville, Kansas in 1942 mm -hmm. or 43, so, but this young man worked for him, with him, in the evangelistic meetings, and uh, he had been born in Russia, and his parents lived in Russia, and the Czar sent him for some reason to Siberia. Mm -hmm. And uh, his little brother and a little sister died on the march to Siberia. Oh. But anyway, they were Seventh day Adventists. And when they came back to their hometown, the Bolsheviks had taken over. Mm -hmm. And he was a young man ready to go in the army, old mm -hmm. enough to go in the army. And he had some friends that was in the army and they were persecuted and made to get in this box with uh, swords or something you know that would close them in unless they denied God mm -hmm. and so his parents decided that they needed to take him out of the country out yeah. of Russia and they did and uh, he, he snuck out into the Scandinavian countries and, okay. and caught a boat to America and he that's what he said that in Russia they were saving books and they would hide them in the eaves of their house and mm -hmm. different places and mm -hmm. and uh, try to have church meetings and you know secret and he said mm -hmm. on the boat they were just they didn't care about God or anything they were just drinking and dancing and he marveled at that in the countries where we have freedom of choice we just we uh, don't respect it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and he, he couldn't understand why the American people and those people on the boat treated their freedom of religion that way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. we have Bibles here. He but how many times? Oh, I'm sorry, you're not finished. I just wanted to say he wrote a book. I think it's called Exiled, and it's about his family. He has it's about Jetski? About Jetski? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I forget his first name, but his last name is Jeske. Yeah. Jeske. Yeah. If you find that book, can you send it to me? Because I'm curious. I have one at home. I'll send it. <laughs> yeah, to I would love to read it. I don't know if we have one. Okay, I don't know. But I was just going to say that, yes, we have freedoms, we have Bibles, but we've heard stories about how they just gather dust. You know, people kind of put them up on the shelf. Look at all these Bibles I've got. They're so pretty. And they, but they don't read them. Mm -hmm. They have no desire. There's no drawing that they're given into that they want to read the Bible. So they just gather. Yeah, this. and they're. I watched this sermon this morning, and that's what I think his name was Audet or something like that. I don't, I and, don't know. Uh, he said that when someone says, "I believe in the truth." I believe in the Trinity of God, but the Holy Spirit when they told you mm -hmm. that's not true. And he said, throw them away because they're not interested in the truth. Yeah. They have their own way. There's a reason the Bible tells us Isaiah 8.20. There's a lot of subtle people out there. There's a quote here on this before we go to the next day's lesson from the Ministry of Healing. And it says, yeah. All the problems, so with all the promises of God's word, in them he is speaking to us individually, speaking as directly as if we could listen to his voice. 
And so it's not the only place she says this either. She says more than once, multiple times, that the Bible is the voice of God as if we could hear him speaking to us. How many of us, when we open our Bible in the morning or at night, whenever you study, how many of us realize that? How many of us realize we're having a conversation with God? Or That's what he wants to do anyway. Yeah. It's his word. Yeah. It's his words to us. So he is speaking to us through his word and through the Holy Spirit as we read. And at the end of it, it says, John Wycliffe's passion to translate the Bible into English Speaking of that, at his trial, Wycliffe said, With whom do you think you are contending? With an old man on the brink of the grave? <laughs> no. With truth. Truth which is stronger than you and will overcome you. I love looking at powerful quotes from the Reformers because I think it was Wycliffe um, where he was on his sickbed. And you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was Wycliffe. The, the, the papists, they came, they were like, Score, he's sick, he's going to give it up now. Um... And they went to him and they said, recant because you're going to die. And he says, not only will I not die, I'm going to recover and I'm going to continue exposing you. Um, that it was just, they were such powerful Christians, not because there was anything special about Wycliffe or Luther or anything, but they found the power of the Word of God. Monday's lesson, uh, we're kind of going over, uh, I believe it, Tyndale a little bit. Tyndale's another one of my favorites. Um... And the scriptures are 2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 to 6, and 2 Corinthians 2, 14. So let's go over those real quick. Let's, uh, somebody can read, get the first one, and someone the second one. Second Corinthians 4, verses 1 to 6. I got it. Do you want me to read it? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, in the face of Jesus Christ. Paul said somewhere else, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, I am resolved to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified. Mm-hmm. Someone read the other one? Anybody get it? Yeah, 2 Corinthians 2, 14. Now thanks be to God who always leads us to triumph in Christ and through, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. So, what was the theme of Paul's messages? Or who? Jesus. Jesus. Mm -hmm. That was it. From that stemmed every other doctrine that Paul taught. But that was the foundation of his message. And if Jesus isn't the foundation of your message, stop preaching. Mm -hmm. Right? What was Paul's question is, though, what was kind of Paul's um, confidence in the Word of God despite his challenges? I don't know if that makes sense. I kind of rephrased it a little bit, but you guys can see the question if you have the lesson. It was confidence that he was telling the truth. And, yeah. And uh, no matter what consequence he had or that anyone laid on him, he still said, hey, what I'm saying is true. Mm-hmm. Through the Word of God. Through the Word of God. Mm-hmm. And, and unfortunately, uh, what I've learned is that um, when you preach the truth with such confidence, some people will like, well, you've got to be wrong since you're, you're so confident it can't be true. <laughs> or, or, or they'll accuse you of being uh, arrogant, things like that. Oh, well. um, they treated Jesus the same way, right? 
um, Paul said in Second Corinthians 13, it says we can, he says we can do nothing against the truth before the truth. Uh, if you walked out there and you saw this giant lion, giant angry lion, how successful would you be in defending yourself against it? Could you do anything? Could you do anything to hurt the lion? I couldn't even run. Yeah. I don't think any of us could run from it. <laughs> even Savannah, as young as she is, she wouldn't do well. You, you can't hurt a lion if all you have is your bare hands. If, even if you had a pocket knife, I always have a pocket knife on me. You're not doing anything to that lion. You can't fight the word of God. Truly, you can't fight it. You can reject it, right? You can't really fight it. It will defeat you. Oh yeah, yeah. He was a bit of a special case. <laughs> he did, yes, that was the difference. Yeah. But here, I mean, the point is, you you can't defeat God's word. It's not possible, right? Um. You know, and and we saw that. If you've read the Great Controversy, which I'm pretty sure all of us have, and I, like I said, I've been listening to it again this week uh, as I've been driving. And one of the things that you hear over and over again during while well, listening to the chapters over the Reformers is that the papacy tried to banish the Word of God. They tried to hide it. They tried to jail those who, who were preaching the gospel. They, tried to, they burned at the stake many people. During the French Revolution, they, they massacred, was it the Huguenots, I think it was? Um... But they never could defeat the word of God. Where they would kill five here, 500 would accept the gospel here. One of my favorite quotes from the Great Controversy is they were seized, but their blood were as sweet. Mm -hmm. So as, as those that were martyred, so many more would rise up because of seeing what they stood for mm -hmm. and how they endured. Yeah, and Tinda was one of those people who was martyred for his faith. I think he was burned. Um, well, it says that yeah, he was burned. Which was merciful, actually. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Compared to what they did to a lot of other people. His last words. Yeah. Last and and that's, that's a good point. Read that. Lord, open this king of England's eyes. Mm -hmm. If you were being strangled, abused, and then set on fire, would that be your prayer? Lord, open the president's eyes. I hope so too. His heart is right. You know, his heart was obviously right. And that was the key. Yes. I don't know if King James was the one that was king when he was. I don't remember. I don't remember. But anyway, it wasn't too many years later that King James the first ordered the translation of the Bible into English. And it says in the note down here that most. Mm -hmm. and, and Tyndale did it because he wanted to improve upon Wycliffe's translation. Wycliffe did a great work, but his translation did include some errors. Um, and so Tyndale wanted to improve on that, and when he published his Bibles and he would be going to be persecuted, he would go somewhere else and start doing it all over again. And one of my favorite stories with Tyndale <laughs> was how one of the cardinals, I think it was, in an effort to um, stop Tyndale's work, he bought all of his Bibles that he had in stock and destroyed them. But what he didn't realize, and he, apparently he wasn't the smartest individual, because he didn't realize that in buying all of those Bibles, he just gave Tyndale more money to do it all over again, and even bigger, bigger and better. And when asked, when he was put on trial for this, when asked, how did you get this? Who funded you? He said, that one right there. That cardinal right there, he bought all my Bibles, and that's how I was able to finance this. Um, and as, as uh, Lenora was bringing out, just a little bit after he died, it says four years, um, four translations of the Bible were published. There was a 1611 King James Version of the Bible. Eventually that was um, revamped, and we have the 20th century. I don't know if it's 20th century, but the newer King James Version. Uh -huh. We couldn't basically use it today. Yeah, what we speak today is 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 a lot it's different a than word. yeah. But it it was translated from that. Yeah, yeah. One thing I think of too when you're talking about what Paul's confidence is is 
Jesus says that mm-hmm. heaven and earth will pass away, but my word. But the word of God never will, and it will not return to him void. And the proverbs right. that the reformers mm-hmm. illustrated that fact. So the, the, the end of uh, this lesson, this today's, this today. I promise I can speak. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> today, today, Daniel twelve three. The lesson brings out: those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Tyndale, Wycliffe, Luther, whoever we're talking about, as far as the reformers go, brought hundreds, if not thousands, of people to the truth. Um, and speaking of of uh, people who were martyred and whatnot, the Bible says in Revelation fourteen verse thirteen. This is right after the third angel's message. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. What does that mean, their works follow them? They're dead. How can their works follow them? Well, through example, through, through guidance, example. through, you know, nowadays, uh, through videos, you know, mm-hmm. they've made Christian videos or sermons. Because while Luther's been dead for going on 500 years, mm-hmm. his example still, his books are still here. But you know, the angels in heaven recorded what they did. Yeah. My great grandmother's been dead 50 years. Mm hmm. Yeah. It's never just about us. Even when we're dead, our example will affect somebody else. One of my favorite quotes from Tyndale, I mentioned the, I like the Protestant reformer quotes. This is probably my favorite quote from Tyndale. He says, um, if God spare my life ere many more years, I will cause a boy who drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than you do. And he, he, and he says, all that I do and suffer is but the way to the reward and not the deserving of it. We don't do anything deserving of what God wants to give us. We can't do anything deserving of eternal life, but we can serve God. And in serving God, we will be brought to the reward. And I think Tyndale said this in context of being told to stop, basically. Um, The Catholic Church has always, even now, their claim is that only the clergy is capable of interpreting the Bible. Um, You know, if I walked in this church and the pastor says, I'm the only one who can interpret the Bible, I'm going to walk right back out, right? Thankfully, that's not what you do. <laughs> but, um, oh, I'm sure. They were right. And that's a, that's a huge thing. You know, we have to be willing to admit when we're wrong, if, especially if we're going to be in leadership. Speaking of Martin Luther, let's go to Tuesday's lesson. Enlightened by the Spirit. This one, this particular day, focuses on Luther. He was somebody from about when he was a young man, entered college, he was somebody who really always cared more about um, spiritual things, less about worldly things, less about materialism. To a point when he entered university, he wanted to enter the clergy, which put a rift between him and his father. They didn't speak for two years. His father wanted him to be, I think it was a lawyer. Um, And I think I remember reading one time, The reason he joined the clergy was because he saw a painting, and in that painting it was a storm on a boat on a a tempestuous sea or something. And in the boat were all the clergy, and outside of the boat was everybody else, giving him the impression that only the clergy can be saved. And so he's like, well, if I'm going to save myself, I need to join the clergy. I need to be a monk or something. And so that's what he did. He went and joined... um, I can't remember the term for it now. Is it cloister? No. I don't. Nuns. What? Nuns. Oh, was that nuns? Uh-huh. Um, I cannot remember the name. I'm drawing a blank. Did you know that Luther wasn't his real name? He'd been to Germany. He found this out. Oh yeah. He changed his name because the way the name was spelled was the same word that he used for a woman. Uh, Leo was used. Oh, oh no! He had, he, I don't remember if he dropped the letter or moved the letter, but anyway, and uh, because he did, he couldn't go to university with that name, 
Yeah, I never knew that. That's interesting. We didn't hit until we were over there. And, uh, we, we stood in four of his churches that he preached, even the last church just before he died. Mm -hmm. His last four sermons from that church. He was a powerful preacher. He was. And the, the lesson brings out that he, it all started when he went to the university library and he found a Latin copy of the Bible. And remember back then this day, this was significant because it was chained up. You couldn't, it was illegal to have a Bible in your own copy in these days. You could get the death penalty for it. Um, and so he just, he started, Imagine you've been homeless and you haven't eaten for three weeks and somebody ought to, ought, takes you to a Chinese buffet or, or, or a buffet. I, I mean, you're just going to be gorging yourself because you're so hungry. The people had been deprived of the Word of God here for centuries. I mean, we're not talking years, we're talking centuries. And Martin Luther comes here and he sees the Word of God and he just starts reading and reading and reading and he cannot get enough like he's been starved for all of his life because spiritually speaking he had been and as the as the pastor referenced a little earlier it says he, Martin Luther eventually said oh that I, God would give me such a book for myself and it brings me back to that to those videos and that experience that you had where people are just like they're so grateful just to have a Bible because they really see it for what it is the voice of God speaking to us um, so let's read these texts that it brings out. And the question is, what principles can we take from the following texts regarding how we should interpret the Bible? So we've talked a little bit about the importance of the Bible, and now it's going to kind of go to the next segment, the next level. How do we interpret it? So John 14, uh, then John 16, and then 2 Peter 1. Okay. Uh, whichever one of you has it. So if you go ahead and read John 14. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, that the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So who's the interpreter of the Bible here in this text? And what specifically does the Bible call him? The Comforter. There was something else as well. The helper. And it says the Holy Spirit will do what? Bring to your remembrance. Yeah, bring to your remembrance. And before that it says something else. To teach. Yes. You should always come to the Bible as a student. Never come to the Bible as I already know this. I've read this. Yeah. Yeah. I've studied the Sabbath for the past 30, 40 years. What else could I learn from it? A whole lot. <laughs> I, I, uh, one of my favorite preachers that I've... Um, it's been a while since I've listened to him, Henry Wright. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. He was talking about Bible study in one of his sermons, and he goes, he, was, he, he wrote over, I think it was around 12 or 13 sermons on the Bible. On, on the, obviously on the Bible. 12 or 13 sermons just on the Sabbath. I mean, it's, it's, there, there's so much that you can learn. Um, John 16, please. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, but he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, mm -hmm. and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it to you. So we're All things that the Father hath of mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. Right. So we see kind of here a structure of, um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, kind of a hierarchy of structure here, of authority here. The Father has a message. He gives it to Jesus. He gives it to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit gives it to us. The Trinity. The Trinity, that yes. A perfect example. Ooh, that's Trinity. a good point for my shareable later. Can we text that to me, please? 
I've been working on that Trinity shareable, by the way. I'm just having trouble mm -hmm. thinking of questions and stuff. But what does it say that the Holy Spirit's going to do? Guide you into all truth. What's the truth? Pilate asked a question. What is truth? God's Word. God's Word. And in John 14, the Bible says of Jesus, Jesus says that He is the truth as well. Amen. So it is both a book and a person. Second Peter, anybody got it? So, what's unique about the Bible as opposed to any other holy book in the world? It's inspired by the Holy Spirit, yes, but there's, there's a different aspect to it. According to Peter here, it's of, no private it's of no private interpretation. Any other holy book, generally written in private. The Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. yeah, I know. Joseph, yeah. Yeah, Joseph Smith had it, took a hat, put his head in the hat, it says this. Put his head in the hat, it says this. And an entire religion was formed off of that book of private interpretation. And this is not to take a dig against Mormons, but it's to say that it's different from the Bible. It's not scripture. But the Bible was written in such a way that it cannot be claimed to have come out in private. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, that's, I'm not saying anything against the religion or anything, just like, yeah. And she kind of said one day, well, maybe I can learn from you, and maybe you can learn from me kind of thing. And it's like, okay. <laughs> I never said anything. So, one of the things that the, yeah, one of the things that the lesson brings out is that what's so powerful in these verses is the assurance that the same Holy Spirit that inspired the Bible authors yeah. teaches us. Yeah. And yes, in the reformers, and that was one of the things that 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 kind of piqued my attention as I was listening to the great controversy this week, particularly the chapter over William Miller, those chapters. He wasn't the only one preaching that message. There was people in England, there was people in the Middle East, there was people in Europe, I think even Africa. There's still a tribe in Africa. I, th I want to say Africa could be the Middle East. There was someone. Who um, yeah, yeah. Um, I think Joseph Wolf was the one in Europe. He was uh, born a Jew um, and went through a hole. I mean, his story was incredible. But it, it brings us to, the, and I say that to just to bring up the point that it was a matter that wasn't private. William Miller didn't think this up on his own. The Adventist pioneers didn't come together and say, hey, guys, let's form a whole new religion so that we can get money and women and, and, and we can get power and authority. Anybody got a hat? Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Um, you know, it's it's not like any other false religion in the world, whether it's Mormonism, Catholicism, or what have you. Um, you know, the doctrine of purgatory was for the purpose of money and authority. Um, that's, <laughs> I had somebody in a recent live stream, I was mentioning purgatory. And they, they cracked a joke in the comments and said something like, with the rising rate of inflation, I wonder what the going rate is to get someone out of purgatory now. <laughs> but the, the Holy Spirit, you know the Holy Spirit's working when you come together and you've been studying something, and you're like, yeah, I saw that too. And you don't realize that both of you came to the same conclusion already. He will lead us all to the same message. So... What the lesson brings out, and whether this is one of the things we saw during the Reformation, since Satan can no longer keep the Bible from us, he does the next best thing, strip it of its supernatural power. During the days of Martin Luther, that was also when, because that was the days when the Protestant Reformation really started getting a whole lot of steam. It had been going on for two or three hundred years already, but um, if not more than that. But during the days of Martin Luther, the Jesuits founded the Counter-Reformation. Um, in addition to that, there was also the um, fanatical version of the Reformation. And both the Counter-Reformation and the fanatics were damaging the real Protestant Reformation. 
Thomas, uh, Thomas Menson, something like that, was mentioned in the Great Controversy as being one of the, a person, he had great ability, but he was of that movement who was like, well, if you have this feeling, you don't need the Bible. And basically, this fanatical movement did the same thing that the Catholic religion was doing, and that was just leading people away from God and leading them into vice and sin, because neither one was founded on the Bible. And Martin Luther was very troubled by this. You read the Great Controversy, he was, he was distressed when he saw this going on. And when he was finally able to come out of hiding and correct the movement, he did, uh, as much as he could. So, the lesson says, what also set the Reformers apart was that they saw that the Holy Spirit, not priests, not prelates, not popes, the Holy Spirit is the infallible interpreter of Scripture. Um, they bring out a quote, so Mary, Queen of Scots, said, You interpret the Scriptures in one manner, and they, the Roman Catholic teachers, interpret it in another. Whom shall I believe, and who shall be the judge? That's a fair question. Who shall be the judge? Who's the judge of the Bible? God is. The Bible is our standard for the Bible. And I've gotten this question in my comments sometimes. Um, you teach this, they teach that. How do we know who's right? Study the Bible. Don't just accept what I have to say just because I'm up here speaking. Exactly. And that's something that's... That's... um. A unique objection I've heard, very common, but at the same time unique, is that whenever I go through the Bible and show all these different verses, speak on whatever topic it is, could be death and hell, could be the Sabbath, I'm always accused of cherry picking. You know, but the Bible tells us in Isaiah 28, compare scripture with scripture. And that's what William Miller did. That's how he was able to come to the conclusion of the 2300 days. Um, and he, and he, even when he wasn't sure of it, he studied it for several more years and finally got to a point where I was like, yeah, this is right. Um, Wednesday's lesson, we got uh, five or six minutes. So let's see if we can get through Wednesday and Thursday because they're both of equal importance. There's something that's wrong? Okay. So the Bible tells us that uh, salvation is of what? If we eat enough vegetables, we're going to be saved. If, if, we, if we come to church often enough on the Sabbath, if we accept Ellen White, we're going to be saved. Salvation is of what? It's a free gift. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. You are saved by grace through faith. And it's not that all those other doctrines that I mentioned are suddenly of no importance. But the Bible says you are saved by grace. You all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But we are justified by who? By Jesus and what he did for us. If the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is? Eternal life, eternal life through who? Through Jesus. One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible is Romans 5, 8 that it brings out. But God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This, the context is speaking of we are natural enemies of God like cats and dogs. The difference is God doesn't try and attack us like a dog will try and attack a cat most of the time. But we're natural enemies of God. But God, even though we were his enemies, he sent Jesus to die for us knowing that we couldn't do anything to, to pay him back. And so the Bible tells us, and this, is a, this, is what's a, this was one of the truths that made the Protestant Reformation what it was, is that salvation is all of grace. Because the Catholic Church teaches what? Salvation by works. In fact, the truth that struck Martin Luther like a lightning bolt when he was climbing Pilate's staircase, do you remember what the great controversy says? The just shall live by faith. And it hit him like a lightning bolt. And he never went back to the sacraments again. 
And as the other reformer saw it, Wycliffe, Swingley, Huss, Jerome, all of them saw this great truth that you cannot earn God's favor. It doesn't matter how many times you pray the rosary, how many times you, play, you climb Pilate's staircase, or how many times you eat the Eucharist. It doesn't matter how perfectly you keep any of the sacraments. It does nothing for you. Not only because the sacraments are not biblical, but because you can't earn God's favor. Now, let's kind of skip over then to Thursday's lesson. Where does obedience come into play then? If we're not saved by obedience, then why obey? We are judged by our obedience. It's like I tell people, your obedience shows who you serve. Somebody read for me um, Romans chapter 6, verses 15 to 18. So Paul says that you are the slaves of the one that you obey, right? If you obey sin, whose slave are you? The devil's. The devil's. Yeah. Because the devil is the originator of sin. He's the one who invented it. And unfortunately, he's still alive, so sin is still alive for a little bit longer. If you obey righteousness, whose slave are you? God's. You're a slave of someone. You're either an unwilling slave of Satan, or some people are willing slaves of Satan. Most are unwilling. Or you are a willing servant of God. Do you think most people believe that? That, that they have to be one way or the other? Can't I just be myself? I'm just, I'm smart. I can just go through this world. I'd say, my life. I'd say most people are like that because it was interesting during the 1800s we had that religious awakening all over the world and then it died out again. The countries that were some of the most on fire for the Reformation now are some of the most postmodern. Well, we just saw it in our presentation this morning. Yeah. Switzerland was, you know, Christian. Mm -hmm. And then now they said there's not, well, there may be some Christians, but not one single Adventist. Yeah. You know. I remember Ellen White talking about one time, I think it was, she said it, that some of the ugliest places in the world or maybe that's not how she says it. Um, some of the, the, the places affected most by the flood were where the rebellion was the strongest. Um, and so, you know, it, it kind of, to me, it, some of the ugliest places in the world today may have been some of the most beautiful before. And, and some of the most stronghold, some of the places where the gospel was in the, in the, in the most, um, I'm not sure, yeah, in the ascendancy, some of the strongest defenders of the gospel. Now those countries are, you can't hardly tell anymore. The world is so postmodern that I'm going to do it my way. My truth is not your truth. I've seen that by Christians. I've seen it said by Adventists. When you do it your way, aren't you doing Satan's work? That's exactly right. Yes, but people don't like to admit that. They're like, I'm just me. I don't follow the devil or God. I'm just me. You know, and they're deceived. And if we they're say that. By default, we follow Satan because we're following self. Mm -hmm. I heard it spoken of by a Seventh-day Adventist pastor last week that we have to submit ourselves to God 100% because if you even leave a half a percent that you didn't surrender, right. then you leave yourself open for Satan to use you, to tempt you, make you bend to his will. Yeah. One, one sin cherished yes. is enough. Yes. Right. Just one. So, yeah, we're just about out of time then. But, um, yeah, I would suggest going through the great controversy and studying the reformers because we can learn a lot about how to serve God more fully and we can learn a lot about how to prepare for what's coming. Yeah. I haven't read that one. I'm gonna I've heard of it, but I'm gonna have to find it. 
All right, shall we pray and we'll uh, call it good? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being with us and for this lesson and for the opportunity to study together. I pray that you will um, help us all individually, but also together as a church to continue seeking you and continue sharing you with the world and prepare us, please, for what's coming so that like the reformers when brought to the stake, we will be smiling instead of being terrified. Be with us, Lord, in your name, amen. Amen. Thank you. That was beautiful.